Welcome to episode two of Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken, and... And this is Keith Isles. Hello. <laughs> so, we're a second episode, and just a few things I wanted to clear up from our first episode, uh, talking about AVP. And now, in the episode, you probably remembered me going on about this tunnel that was made by the Predators. And I said, I didn't know how that happened or where it happened and all that kind of stuff. So don't tell me you went back and watched it. Oh, dear. I did. I did. Because I felt like an <laughs> idiot. I was like, I, I, I remember this. Why? Why? Oh. Anyway, um, I went back. I watched it. Um, what it is, is that the idea is that they find the temple with the satellite because the power is coming on, that they see like the heat signature. So the predators are already on their way. They're going there on their, I don't know, ice and tenure hunt there. And so the the all the sort of explorers and stuff who are making their way there, you know, it, it's like a trap for them because without humans they can't um they can't go on the hunt. There won't be any aliens. So yeah, so you see them making their way there, and then you see the predator ship approaching earth and then you see it fire this laser beam making this tunnel and it's just, it seems to be all on automatic okay fair enough well i'm glad we've cleared that up <laughs> is, is there somebody knocking on you yeah i i have to apologize um there this there appears to be some construction work going on um next door and it seems that they, they they're quite happy to do it in the evenings uh ah, much right. to my annoyance so i do apologize if you can hear a bit of um, hammering and drilling and stuff going on in the background, it's not ideal, I know, but uh, um, it's out of my control, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! It's not oh, a predator. Well. Hopefully, it's not some predators <laughs> trying to uh, trying to burrow their way through the wall and uh, <laughs> you know hunt me and kill me in my own <laughs> flat or anything like that. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> just just hide all the weapons you'll be fine indeed indeed and it's... and have a and and have a pregnant woman as well well that 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 might take me a while but uh, <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> uh yes my lord i grabbed this pregnant woman off the street because i didn't want a predator to hunt me indeed indeed oh my god we're, we're so off track already aren't we <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So uh, just <laughs> just to clear up um, AVP. Uh, yes, I now know why uh, the predators had, you know, made that tunnel and all that kind of stuff. Cool. It's still a bad. It's still a bad film. It's it's a film where it's so many coincidences that if they hadn't seen the heat bloom and hadn't turned up, the predators would have turned up there and gone, um, okay. Uh, no humans, nothing to hunt. Oh, this is good. There you go. There you go. There I you must go. admit, you know, like I said last time, a bit of a love-hate relationship with all these films. And I have to be honest, I haven't gone back and watched, um, you know, AVP for, for some time, which probably says something. Yes. <laughs> Enough about the last episode. Let's uh, get, on one, get on with this episode. Indeed. The director we've chosen this time is... B for Burton. Tim Burton. Yay. Absolutely. Tim Burton. Uh, yeah, really. In, well, I mean, before we get into the actual films about the man himself, uh, I, I've, I've always found him a very interesting filmmaker. Um, you know, I remember for me, the first film I saw of his was actually Beetlejuice. He, he'd, he'd done, obviously, the Pee Wee Herman films before that, which I hadn't seen. Um, well, he did um, only one of them. I know there's two. I've seen the second one, but I haven't seen the first one, which is Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Right. I mean, I know of it. I know it's about Pee Wee loses his bike and he tries to find it. And I've, I've seen the trailer for it so many times, but uh, it never struck me as something that I really wanted to watch. No, same I know. here. Same here. Yeah. I, I have to confess, I still haven't seen them <laughs> to this day. So, uh, brilliant Tim Burton ex expert. I am, aren't I? <laughs> but, uh... Well, we're not experts. We're just talking about the films we indeed, like and indeed. and not um, like. I mean, I, th I think I think you know about him as a filmmaker. Um, one of the things I've always sort of found 
quite interesting about him, um, you know, and, and I have his films have been a bit sort of for me, some of them I really love and other, others I don't really like much at all. So, it, so I've, he, he's always been a director that's pro, uh, divided me a little. Uh, however, one of the things I've always thought about most of his films is that they do have a um, a very distinct style and, and, and look and feel. And, and if we were, you know, if, if there is any um, truth at all in the sort of auteur theory, I know, I know we're not doing a theory podcast, but, you, you know, in terms of modern cinema, you know, cinema of the last sort of 30 years or whatever, um, I wonder whether he could be perhaps one of the directors that, that could be classed as a sort of modern auteur in terms of, you know, having a real signature and, and, and style uh, on his work. I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with you, actually, because um, every time you you can flick onto a Tim Burton film in any point and you know it's a Tim Burton film. Exactly. Uh, it, it, it has he has his stamp all over it. Uh, there are always um, gothic characters, either in temperament or look. I mean, his, his characters always have a unique look about them. Uh, also, the fact that there's certain um, traits that he always has to his films, like at the, the opening credits, he'll be following something or going through something. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. And he's, he, he's usually got some sort of... Uh black and white spirals or checkers or something playing in the imagery at some point, you know, <laughs> uh, seems to be a, a sort of trademark. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I was, I was just thinking about this obviously prior to uh, knowing that we were going to record this. And, um, you know, I was very much sort of thinking, you, you know, obviously um, most of that sort of stuff came from, uh, you know, European cinema and you, you know um whether it be sort of german expressionism or, or french new wave or all these sort of things that are theories out there and obviously it was adopted by uh hollywood and, and british cinema uh you, you know through the likes of of hitchcock and 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 obviously like powell pressburger and all that with their technicolor films but uh yeah i i, I don't know i was trying to think about sort of modern directors that have that sort of um very unique stamp uh visually uh and what they do and 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 yeah i was just sort of thinking tim burton kind of ticks that box in in modern well, he cinema. doesn't kind of he does he yeah. just tick that box very much i mean a lot of the the films in his filmography have been adaptations of other work Indeed, but, yes. But they also have been his original work as well. And and with both, there's always his stamp on it. You can always tell it's a Tim Burton film. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, um, you, you, you know, it, it doesn't work for every single film he's tried to, um, you, you know, make or, or, or adapt. But uh, it's it certainly... I would say on a majority of his films um, has worked very well and, uh, y y y you know, uh, is indeed very, very, uh, well, creative, you know, which is what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of the stories are always about uh, an outsider. You know, it's somebody who's outside the norm, be it Edward Scissorhands, Batman, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka, uh, Sweeney Todd. Big Fish. Um, Big Fish. Which the, is a great film. I can't remember what the character is in Dark Shadows, but he's, a, again, somebody who's out the norm because he's out of his own time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, do, do you think that maybe, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I've seen, I, I've been lucky enough to see um, Tim Burton interviewed a, a couple of times at various Q&As and whatever over the years. And I've watched, obviously, some of his documentaries and, and, and uh you, you know, listen to commentaries and stuff that he's done. No surprise there, right, for me. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know. In, in some respects, I wonder whether maybe, you know, in his youth or whatever, perhaps he was a little bit of an outsider himself, possibly. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, he does come I mean, across like that, you know. <laughs> I mean, he, he he dresses black in black all the time. And, um, you know, if somebody does an impression, it's always like, I'm Tim Burton. I'm a... Uh, 
I'm an artist, you know, and he's sort of frail and, you know, weak sounding, which is uh, not true. I mean, I've seen interviews with him and he's, you know, very articulate, very uh, passionate, very, very passionate, very well spoken. Um, the, I, I did love the fact that um, he got pissed off with Kevin Smith. Because Kevin Smith wrote a, a script for Superman Lives. Oh, that's right. Yes. And uh, Tim, when Tim Burton came on board, uh, Kevin Smith was, I wouldn't say dismissed, but, um, you know, it was the end of his contract. It was the end of him writing the script because Tim Burton wanted to bring one of his own script writers on board. Right. OK. Was this the one that had Nicolas Cage involved? This is the one with uh, Nicolas Cage, the one right. that there's a documentary about coming out. There's a documentary about how this film was like, you know, getting ready to be shot. And it just it didn't. Nothing happened. Oh, man, I've got to see that documentary. I love those sort of things. <laughs> what could have been. <laughs> it's crazy seeing Nicolas Cage with like long black hair and the, the Superman suit he had. Or... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was terrible. Wasn't it the sort of. A... 80s one where it was like a sort of black jumpsuit with the blue uh superman logo on 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 the cr crest on on the chest or something was that uh, right i've seen one image where it's kind of like it's he's it's weird because it makes him look like an action figure <laughs> but he's actually got like uh, you can see the top of his chest this is like a big um round neck top it just looks it just looked weird i mean there's other i know there's other designs and stuff i mean i it's based on the comic books um death of superman and the return of superman right yes yeah so they were going to do the whole doomsday fight and him coming back and i don't know if they were going to do the age of the superman probably but you know in a very truncated way mm, okay. but anyway i mean um Kevin Smith saw the ending of Planet of the Apes where it was very similar to a comic book he had for Clark's, the idea of what would happen if monkeys took over the world. It's like Jay daydreaming, going, oh, what would it be like if monkeys took over the world? And you have the twist ending of Planet of the Apes. And uh, sorry, guys, if you've not seen these films we're going to talk about, we are spoiling them. <laughs> spoiler alert. Spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. Yeah, you know, Post-spoiler alert. You've been spoiled. You know, and he said to a, you know, a you know, like a guy in the press said, oh, you know, it's very much like my ending of the film. You know, he, he, he. And then, of course, they put a statement in the newspaper saying, Kevin Smith pissed off with Tim Burton stealing ending. And... Uh, Tim Burton rebut rebuttaled and he, you know, he had, you know, he refuted it. He said he didn't read comic books. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that, that might I know. make some of the things I'm going to talk about in a bit redundant then, <laughs> yeah. if that's truly the case, but okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, he might have meant that he doesn't read comic books by Kevin Smith. But right. I mean, Kevin Smith had been given, you know, copies of the script and he would write, you know, fuck you, Tim Burton. Oh, Smith. dear. Really? That bad, course, eh? Okay. Yeah, well, you know, and I guess Tim Burton saw this and he was not happy. And uh, they they took a statement, the uh, newspaper from Tim Burton's uh, agent, but uh, it seems he had a lot more to say. So, um, you know, he's not the sort of weak, artistic man that they, everybody tries to make him out to be. No, not at all. Absolutely. OK, fair enough. Well, there you go. Um, right. Shall we? Uh, let's let's kick off. So, all right. Keith, what is your pick for movie heaven? OK, well, my, my pick for movie heaven, um, interestingly, <laughs> as to some of what we've just been talking about, is um, uh, his take on, on Batman, which he did in, in 1989. Um, I remember it very well. I, I was actually a teenager um, when the film came out, and I remember I did go and see it at the cinema. I lived in uh, in Bournemouth at the time, which is where I'm from, and I went and saw it. Uh, it was one of those ones where it was back in the day when you did used to have to pretty much queue around the block, hence Blockbuster. Um, you know, to get in and see a film, and it was absolutely packed, and the atmosphere was amazing because they had. Uh, a guy dressed up in the full Batman uh, costume and they had a guy oh, wow. dressed up as Joker and they did a sort of little 
stage <laughs> thing before the film came on. Um, a bit like, I guess, you know, on a smaller scale, but a bit like what secret cinema and stuff tend to do nowadays. And uh, yeah. It, it, yeah, you know, it was rather cool. Bearing in mind, you know, that was that was some years ago now. Um, but the thing is, with me, what, what, what I remember sort of that, that, that struck me. Um, and it seems weird saying this sort of in today's world um, and also makes me sound like a, 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 an absolute dinosaur as well. But I remember, you, you know, basically I was into film and into wanting to, to make films or be involved in films since I was a child, you know, since I was like maybe six or seven years old, literally that young, uh, before I knew what a lot of it was. And obviously, you know, there, in terms of what's available today, you know, with the internet and, and, and you know, DVD extras and all those sort of wonderful things that we've got at our fingertips today, um, learning about, you know, how films were made and what films were and, and how they were, you know, uh, put together was, was, was somewhat limited in, in, in its availability. I mean, there were books on film theory that you could read and there were some books on the making of films and I remember I used to get a magazine called um, Starburst magazine which I believe is still actually published it's to come this back. day yeah or it's come back it's, it's, it's come back and, yeah. and, and that used to have you know interviews and some information on how films were made and indeed um, the thing that got me started with the whole thing was, was you know when I was very young I saw the making of Raiders of the Lost Ark on the television and videotaped it and literally like watched it every day um but you know I, at this point i was i was learning the whole time about what directors do what writers do what producers actually do and you know what all the different terms meant and i think the thing that struck me with with batman um tim burton's batman uh, was it was when i really understood that and I think this is because he is quite extreme with his imagery and his interpretation is that that's when I really understood that that's what a, a director's job was it was about interpretation of the material and um I used to you know when, when I uh, a few couple of years back I used to teach um uh, 16 to 19 year olds film studies and and, and media studies and uh, I used to sort of say to we used to try and define what a director's job was. And I used to say, you know, it's kind of his or her job is to interpret the script through the use of uh, actors and designers and use of camera and editing, um, you know, in a sort of way to just try and sum up something that's very big in, into a sentence, if you like. And um, one of the things I showed them to really um, sort of hammer this point home was um, we had a class where I showed them uh, The Dark Knight by Christopher Nolan okay? okay and we had a break and then we had to come back for the second class and for the second class I showed them the 1966 William Dozier Batman movie that was based on the television <laughs> series that starred Adam West okay and uh, trust me you, you know they do were you know blown something? away by this <laughs> yeah do you know something go for it some days you just can't get rid of a bomb absolutely yes <laughs> it's got to be one of the best lines in it yeah no absolutely ever but best best lines ever indeed but um the re the reason the reason I sort of put that on as an exercise was, you know, I mean, we talked about it in some depth afterwards. The kids found the uh, the 66, you know, campy, uh, colourful TV uh, tongue in cheek adaption. Very, very interesting. But this this was the whole point. We were saying, well, look, essentially, we're talking about the same set of characters. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, you know similar story points in places. Yeah. But, you know, you couldn't ask for two completely different films than you know uh nolan's dark knight and um and 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 the 1966 batman film in terms of, in terms of the way it's interpreted interpreted and portrayed you know um yes you know some of the iconography is the same because it came from the source material of the comics so you know the bat signal and the bat logo and whatever remain but you know essentially it's different on all levels yeah and to get back to sort of tim burton that was kind of how I felt when I saw the first Batman film, because my only exposure uh, to Batman, other than 
you know, seeing him in comic books at the time was that 60s television series when it was having its reruns. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, it just it just really made an impact on me because it, I went to see something and I wasn't expecting, you, you know, to see or to experience what I saw. Um, and, you know, it, it, for for me, I mean, I, I love obviously I love what Nolan has has done in in recent years with with the Batman franchise, and of course it's you know it's going to continue, you, you know, with new films co- coming uh, you know next year, etc. Another reboot, but um, uh, you, you know, for me, the, the the original Tim Burton one still remains right up there uh, as one of the great uh, Batman film interpretations and and you know i still love it to this day so that's why i chose this one as as, as the movie heaven if you like of tim burton because uh, because of the impact that had on me and as i said up until that point the only tim burton film i'd seen which i'd seen on vhs was was beetlejuice and you know i thought it was odd when i heard that the actor who was playing beetlejuice was going to be playing bruce wayne batman i thought what really <laughs> but it have worked. you <laughs> did you read any of the trivia about uh batman 89 well i mean i know i know it was one of those projects that had been in um you, you know it had been in development for some years and there'd been various you know directors and actors and and things of that nature involved and i know there was a lot of um uh, controversy over over the decision um when, you know when the casting decision came uh that that, that, that keaton was going to be cast um but but you know I, I i look at it nowadays as a modern classic um you you, you know uh Okay, it, many could argue the film's called Batman. In many respects, it's not really Batman's film. It, it, it's the Joker's film. Um, you, you know, this again, unlike anything that, that sort of happened be- before this, dealt with the origins of the character of Joker. Uh, again, it was very much a uh, Jack Nicholson interpretation of that, you know, with this sort of sophisticated, um, you, you know, gangster uh, Joker, you know, mob boss type Joker, uh, as opposed to, you know, what in more recent years Heath Ledger did with it and took it in a completely different direction, both in my mind, equally valid and equally as good as one another, just very different interpretations again of, 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 of that character. Um, well, I asked that because um, it was interesting to read the trivia for this film because there's a lot of trivia, but they, they state that um, Mel Gibson was considered to play Batman okay. before Michael Kidd. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess he was very, at the time, he was very popular off the back of the Lethal Weapon movies and whatever around that time, wasn't he? So, um, yeah, uh, it, would have, it would have been a completely different um, Batman, oh, that's totally, for sure. Oh, totally, totally. But I think it's a bit of BS <laughs> okay. because we've seen this now. With hindsight, you look at Tim Burton's body of work and he likes working with the same actors. Very much so, yeah. So he's just come off Beetlejuice with Michael Keaton doing that amazing role and he wants to work with him again. So who's he want to going to work with? He's going to want to work with Michael Keaton. He's not going to want to work with Mel Gibson, Some, you know, to him an actor who he doesn't really know or worked with before. It may have been a case that Mel Gibson was the producer's choice, Michael Keaton was the director's choice, and it just came down to availability. I think um, Mel Gibson was off doing Lethal Weapon 2. Yeah, yeah, I know they sort of, well, I think I think Lethal Weapon 2 came out around the same time as, time, as Batman yeah. Returns or whatever, didn't it? So it was um, certainly around that era. But, um, I mean, I, I don't know, and, and unfortunately... Um, you know, between the last podcast and this one, I, I didn't, annoyingly, I didn't have uh, the time that I hoped to have to go back and revisit a lot of stuff. But the the Blu-ray uh, edition of Batman is absolutely packed with hours of, of documentaries, which I have watched, you know, back, back before that covers a lot to do with the development uh, of the material and the post uh, the, the pre-production and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it may deal with some of those um, 
stories. I'd, I'd also heard a rumor that Bill Murray at one point was um, yeah was attached as well. Yeah, um, that that made me laugh. Yeah, it's like well, you know that would have been an interesting Batman, but uh, I can't see it somehow. It would have it would have been very diff. It would have been very weird to have you know Jack Nicholson you know facing up to Bill Murray, <laughs> and and I don't know they would have like. Um, Matching, an improv matching hairlines. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> so, it would certainly uh, make the line, ooh, we've got a wild one here. Indeed. Much more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I did, you know, I, I, I think that the, even by today's standards, um, the, you know, the, the, the film holds up very well, um, bearing in mind, it, you, you know, at the time, pretty much everything was done in camera as, as sort of special effects rather than visual effects as such. I mean, that, there were some. No, uh, I'm going to disagree with you. I, I've, I actually watched it again this weekend. There, um, there's some stuff in it that's not held up very well, especially the, um, the models of uh, Batman and Vicky Vale hanging off the tower at the end. They so much look like a little... I don't know, like models. Oh, really? A little okay. doll. Yeah, I mean, this it, it doesn't look good. And also the fact that um, there's a, a weird miscoloration on the Joker's suit. It goes from purple to red when he you see him on the ledge. Oh, what, when, when he's doing... hanging it towards the end, yeah. Before when he... he's well, you notice it more when he's kicking the uh, stones and you know stepping on their feet, uh, hands where they're hanging on the the side there. It's all the looking down shots when they're looking up at him waving to the helicopter. Mm -hmm. It's fine, but the it's like the something went wrong with the processing because you notice it for even Batman. Yeah, looks a bit darker. A purple is an odd color for for definitely for film processing, which it would have been at the time. Um, but uh, okay, I mean, I mean, one of the things you you know, fair enough. Maybe some of the special effects or whatever. Um, you know, you know, the visual effects don't don't uh, hold up quite so well. But one of the things, I, I, you know, that, that I think does work with a lot of it is is the fact that um, one of one of um, Tim Burton's choices, uh, which very very different to say Christopher Nolan's choice further down the track, was you, you know the the Batman world and the world of Gotham City and the world when that film is set. It isn't in any particular time period that's recognizable, meaning it certainly is you know that they've got um you know he, Batman has certain technology and whatever yet um you, you, you know the, the 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 costume design for the for the characters and the gangsters you know whatever it's very film noir with you know with hats and things of that nature they carry tommy guns. The photographers have the old style flashes with the big bulbs and stuff like that. So it, it's all kind of this sort of mix match. I mean, even with the uh, diegetic music, it, it, it doesn't really fit because you've got no. Prince's soundtrack, which is very sort of, um, you know, I mean, you've got Danny Elfman's soundtrack, sorry, but you've got Prince's uh, source music, which is obviously very sort of of the time, late 80s. And sort of, so as, as a result, it's almost a bit like, it was a bit like the point I was making on, um, on a podcast before when I was talking about uh, Gotham and the fact mm. that they've they kind of unlike Arrow and the Flash and whatever which is very much set now and you know they use the internet and computers and stuff to to, to help solve the crimes and whatever you know with Gotham yes they've got mobile phones albeit they're not smartphones or anything but the look of it is very it's very hard to sort of determine exactly when and it is because it's a sort of mixture of old and new and, and things of that nature. And that's very much what I what I liked about sort of Tim Burton's take on it. Um, equally, of course, I love Christopher Nolan sort of bringing it into the real world and explaining things and all that. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm not sort of saying that one works better than the other, um, but, it, but it is one of the things that sort of struck me. And, and very much, again, I think a sort of Tim Burton stamp, if you like, is, is making it somewhat... Um, alternative world, worldly or whatever. I'm, I'm trying to say. <laughs> I've lost my words completely. But, you know. Um, so yeah. Well, look, I just wanted to say. I mean, I was kind of uh, jealous that you picked Batman. 
because I that was my choice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Um, because well, I get well, to talk about it. I, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. Did you, is well, it your choice as love or hate though? That's the uh... no, no. But as as love, mm. and I'll tell you why. Um, back in the run up to the film, I mean, I had been a, a Batman fan as a kid, and around the time. Um, I was I got caught up in the hype and it got me back into comic books and I was reading comics like The Killing Joke mm-hmm. and The Dark Knight Returns. Which were both very influential as well, I think, in with Burton. Um, I think it's fair to say, isn't to, it? To some extent, yeah. Yeah. To some extent. And um and yes, and I remember turning on the, the TV and watching this hour long documentary. That was not just about the making of Batman, but it was about the history of Batman. Oh, wow. And of course, I suppose at the time, Batman would have been about 50 years old around that time. That's right. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Yes, it was the 50th anniversary. So that's what they were celebrating. And it just coincided that the film was coming out for it. And, oh, man, I was looking forward to it. Now, Batman in this country was the first 12. It was the first film to get a 12 certificate. Right, okay. And I was... I went to see it for my birthday, my 13th birthday. Yay. I went I went to Edgware to the Canon Cinema and we missed the morning screening. We missed it by five minutes. I was like, nope, not going in. I, I want to see it all. I want to sit and eat, watch the commercials, the trailers, and we'll watch the film from very beginning to the end. So we waited. We waited two hours to go and see the film. And we were like first one in that queue. And um, Oh man, when I came out of that screening, uh, I wanted to be Batman. <laughs> yeah, no, I wanted to be Batman. We've all wanted that at some point, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> My friend who I went to see with it, uh, James, uh, for the rest of that, the next school year, we were just planning to be like, we were going to be a pair of Batman. <laughs> we were going to, we were going to build our cave and we we're going to fight crime. And, you know, I imagine now when I, I think about it, I've, we probably end up looking like two fathers for justice <laughs> running around <laughs> or uh Del Boy and um Ro- oh yeah Rodney and Rodney. And Del Boy. yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> love it but man i it was a it was a hell of an experience it's it was a great experience to watch at the cinema you you come out of it pumped yeah and of course i went back and i watched it again this weekend cuz i wanted to be prepared after avp and I have to say, it's a bit of a mess. Really? Okay. Uh, it is a bit of a mess story-wise. Uh, but it's a glorious mess. It's an absolute glorious mess. You can tell there was too many cooks in the kitchen. Right. There's, there's a bit of this and a bit of that. And, you know, some things aren't quite explained. And I remember there was, I remember there was a few things in the comic book. Because I, 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 after that, you know, I just... I got caught up in the whole uh, merchandising thing and I bought figures, toys, comic books, all that kind of stuff. And there were certain things in the comic book that they had films, but they left out. Like when the Joker's throwing away the free money, it's all supposed to be fake. It's all got his face on it. Because when Vicky Vale says, what do you want? And he goes, my face on the dollar bill. Mm -hmm. And it, it does. They shot it. They did it. And it doesn't appear in the film. Right, and also the 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 fact that um these you know his gang of hoodlums there's like some of them just appear out of nowhere <laughs> like the kung fu fighting one with the swords right you yeah. know in the alleyways just ah just jumps over a fence <laughs> and then he gets knocked out yeah I mean I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean I mean I know there was there's there's an infamous um. There was a, a a horse chase scene that, oh, that yes. um, this is where Sean Young, who was originally cast as Vicky Vale, um, actually had a, an accident and fell off and broke a collarbone. So it ceased production. And then that's when they had to, I think it was John Peters, who was the producer, um, yes. got, Vic, um, got Vicky Vale, got Kim Bassinger, Kim Bassinger. involved yeah. as, as, as um, Vicky Vale. But uh, yeah, I, I know there was definitely more to it. And obviously... It spawned, you know, an animated series that was kind of sort of loosely based 
on that sort of world as well. Um, yes. Well, it kept the theme tune. Yes, it did. It? it kept the Danny Elfman, which which is great. You know, uh, it's, theme. I, I I love the soundtrack. I mean, the soundtrack is brilliant because I mean, it's it, it straight away you feel like it's Batman. That's what's missing from Christopher Nolan's Batman is it's got no theme. I mean, it kind of does, but it's you know, you you. I mean, I could sing the the Batman thing for you, like da 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 da. Actually, I'm doing the last bit, the final bit. Da 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 da. Yeah, you yeah. know the great bit when it's going up the building and you just see him standing there with the bat. Oh no, signal. I mean that's great. I mean, I mean, yeah. I think you know this is the thing with with cinema now is 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 you know music. Music has changed to be sort it's of, changed a lot, you know, yeah. it's less leading to the audience now. It's less bombastic. It's less, you, you know, bearing in mind, we, we were still in that Star Wars phase with 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 very much having themes for characters and stuff. At, at that I know, point, but there's, we? I mean, you just said bo- things are actually more bombastic. They're more sort of aimed at the trailer. They're, a lot of it's like trailer music. I mean, if you think of the music for Inception, where it says, darn, darn. Dun, dun. You know how many times have you seen that used on trailers? Oh now? yeah, no, he must be uh, Hans Zimmer must be uh, raking it in on that alone. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to be a very busy boy. He is indeed very busy boy. He is indeed. But no, I mean, you, you know, you know the the, the whole um, the whole Batman uh, thing. Like like you said, yes, um, I, I see where you're saying about it, it being a bit of a mess in places. Um, I also, you know, it was a very sort of like you said vibrant time for. For Batman at the time with the, those sort of in the late 80s, those graphic novels, you know, by Frank Miller and whatever yeah. that were coming out that were definitely, I think, informing some of what was going on. The, the, the one, maybe one of the criticisms I had in some respects was, as well as it, you, you know, you said about it being a mess, but in some respects, it also tied things up a bit too neat. And and what I mean by that was the, the Joker and the, you know, the Napier character, being the one that killed his parents and you you, you you know that all seemed i have to say i mean that's a change in the mythology slightly but it all seems somewhat convenient <laughs> yeah it's convenient that yeah and it's just so they can have that line at the end you know you created me but i create you know yeah i created you but you created me first and it's like wow that's really uh, juvenile to say that you know and then he puts his you know would you hit a man with glasses on yeah yeah the one reason to watch that film is for jack nicholson oh he's amazing he's having a blast absolutely having a blast and there's moments where he is copying uh jack palatz yes yeah absolutely I mean... <laughs> yeah no and he's doing a very good impression of him impression, as well. yeah i mean obviously he got incredibly well rewarded for the film oh, it made movie i think history. it's the highest that yeah <laughs> to this day there is there's nobody who's got paid that so much because he got a uh, cut the merchandising and the merchandising was off the scale no absolutely absolutely and of course this was i mean another big change for this um or for you know we take it for granted now with the versions of batman that, that we see but i mean at the time the the, the, the batman costume this was something of a breakthrough because prior to that, it had been sort of tights as spandex and stuff, uh, you, you know, up until that point. So, um, you, you know, That's coming right. in with this sort of molded rubber armor, um, you, you know, in the way that, that, that most superheroes since have, have, have done that, um, you know, was, was a big thing. It was the same costume designer who did the stilt suits in June. Oh, and wow. They were very sculptured rubber. If you remember them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This was, yeah, the whole suit was supposed to be like whole body armor, but it was so heavy, you know, there, there had to be a double in it. Yeah. I mean, I love the, um, the scene at the end up in the Balfrey where he's fighting those guys and you do feel like he's getting his ass kicked. Yeah. Which you don't get in many of the Batman films. I mean, in Dark Knight Rises, Yes, Bane breaks his back. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. I I love the I love the first two um, Nolan films. You, you know, I, I, they're amongst some of my favourite films. But I do, I do have issues with the uh, the Dark Knight Rises. I really do, and uh, I, I, I guess I, that's not for this podcast. I'm sure, but you, you know, yeah, I, there are things in that that uh, that didn't quite work in in my opinion. But uh, 
<laughs> but yeah, and, and but you're right. You know, that's the only time we see him get a proper ass whooping. <laughs> oh, it does. Um, it does, and uh it, it's it's a, a film I'm very fond of, and um, I, I I still even even with the things I could spot was wrong with it, and you know, Vicky Vale. I mean, Vicky Vale is kind of like the Willie Scott of the Batman series. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I like the uh, I like the comparison there. But yes, yeah, she was a bit scream, scream. You're in a horrible place. <laughs> it was. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning, she actually had she, she seemed to be driving the story, and then halfway through, she just became the screamer. Yeah, and it just it was annoying, and just again, that's one of the problems the story has because it has this character and it's trying to do something with it you know you know it, it's the only time that bruce um, bruce wayne kind of has a relationship with a woman you know a proper relationship and you know it and it, it's funny now when you see the end when she's in the the car with alfred and alfred's going oh well this Wayne said he's going to be a bit late and she goes yes i know I always thought, oh, wow, she's going to wait for him and all this stuff. And then, but now watching the scene where she turns up in the back cave, <laughs> which it makes me laugh yeah. to the point that, you know, there's Bruce Way. He is having his flashback. He's figuring out who the Joker is. And then he turns around, this is Vicky Vale. I mean, they they made a joke out of it in Batman Returns, but it just it was like wow on top of the, one or the other. Yeah. But the thing is, she says to him, "Are we going to try to love each other?" And he says, "I would like to, but he's out there, mm -hmm. and I got to go to work." Now, to me, as a as a teenager, that was like, "Oh, he's going to go and kick his ass, and then he's going to come back." As an adult, it's kind of like him admitting that. I can't have a relationship. I can't have a proper relationship because I'm always going to be out there fighting crime. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm not the stay at home, you know, be with you, <laughs> Vicky. A house you know. husband type. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or just a normal person. Yeah. Which I don't know. Well, I mean, I can, re I can relate to that because I'm a director. Yeah. No, and, I know what you mean. Me too. And all, all my relationships I've had previously, they, you know, for a short while, they think it's great. I'm direct. I'm dating a director, and then you realise you don't do much during the day, or you're working evenings or weekends, and you know times when they're free and they want to be with you, and you're like, and they can't deal with it. Yes, I can certainly relate, but I'm I'm just not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Uh, it, it's it's an alternative lifestyle choice um, being a filmmaker, much as being a um, crime fighter <laughs> <laughs> a, wing, a winged vigilante you know that's the other thing is is michael keaton you know definitely uh, um you know portrayed that quite well uh that tortured character he does but he he breaks character in one point and that is when he goes when he goes nuts oh in yeah Vicky you want to go nuts um, let's go nuts yeah, that, yeah, go yeah nuts that that bit is pure michael keaton that is not Bruce Wayne. That's not Batman. That was just pure Michael yeah. Keaton. Because you can kind of see when he when Jack Nicholas, you know, when the Joker goes, "Ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight?" And he goes, "What?" what? <laughs> and you go, "Oh, he's back acting now. <laughs> he's back to be Bruce Wayne." Yeah, no, absolutely. But of course, the other thing of the other thing about this Batman film is this is the one Batman movie where they actually only have the one villain against him which you know uh, in some respects i think works quite well you know they, they always seem the need to yeah. sort of overload in these superhero movies you know with all of the all of the um back catalog of villains turning up and you just think oh no save them for future movies please you know what i mean so um i actually like the fact that it was just um the joker the in this particular villain. film yeah and it worked really well i mean it's is a sh again, it's that kind of thing where though it's very against Batman's nature to kill somebody, and he clearly kills the Bat Joker. Yes, yeah. I mean, I remember after the film, there were all these, you know, rumors about he was going to be bought back by black magic, and you know, all of this sort of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, the, you know, yeah. rumor mill. But uh, but no, I mean, the thing with that movie is, even though it is okay, part of a, a series that, that followed there, 
but you can it does actually totally work and i think tim burton in some respects made it as a standalone film i mean it is a film that has a beginning middle and end yeah. and if there were no more batman films that followed it um you know it wouldn't matter it sort of works on its own um but of course you know warner had to uh, had to jump on that bandwagon and make sequels obviously <laughs> it's, uh... i know but I have to say this though, I felt Batman Returns was more Tim Burton than Batman. Yeah, I, I I understand exactly what you mean. Um, I almost think it went a bit too far though, uh, with that. I, I, I remember I, I liked it. I think um the story wise it was a bit more coherent. It, it, it you know, and had, Michael Keaton seemed to be a lot more comfortable in his yeah. role. And and you know, and yeah, the the look of that Gotham was very different to the Gotham from Batman, but they just, they, they moved from Pinewood studios to whatever studios were filming in America. Well, it felt that that was one of my problems with it is it felt to me very claustrophobic. I mean, it felt like the set was just a square (laughs) and it was that square that they, they chase around and there was no more to Gotham City than that. And um, but I but I do understand what you mean. I I I didn't enjoy um Batman Returns as much uh for, for me personally, but I do uh totally agree with what you're saying that it does feel even more of a Tim Burton film uh than the first film. And maybe, you know, he had more control because of the success of the first film, possibly. Um, you, you know, maybe there weren't so many cooks, as you put it, at that point. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. Of course, I love Michelle Pfeiffer in a in a cat suit. Who wouldn't? Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, overall, I didn't. I don't know. I, I didn't feel that that film worked quite as well f- for me. But um, but but uh, it was a successful film none, nonetheless, and uh, continued was, the yeah. uh, continued the franchise. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> right. Well, let's let's move off Batman because oh, I think we could we talk could about talk about it, all, right? I mean, we could talk about all the other films as well. But that, like you said, like I often say, that's a whole other podcast, right? <laughs> yes. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, my choice for movie heaven is completely different to Batman, and that is uh, Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Wow. Okay. Now, um, I didn't see this one at the cinema. Uh, I was introduced to it by a friend of mine, a composer by the name of Stephen Cartwright. And um, I saw it around at his place and he warned me, he warned me before watching it, that the music in it is nothing like you've ever seen. I asked him, what do you mean? He says, there is no chorus in it. It's all Mm -hmm. verse. I was like, oh, okay. And so I, I sat down and watched it, thinking, okay, musical, and I'm not really going to sing along. I thought it was brilliant. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, it's because it's, it's speech by a okay. song. They're talking. It's conversations. But it's, it's, in, it's in song form. Right. I mean, it's, to my knowledge, it's the only Tim Burton film that's got an 18 certificate. It's the closest thing he's got to um, doing a hammer horror. Um, well, Sleepy Horror, sleep, oh, sorry, Sleepy Hollow is a hammer horror, but I think this is even closer. And um, I think it's just great. It's probably one of the best performances by, um, oh, God, Johnny, Johnny Depp. Depp <laughs> Johnny Depp, yeah, okay. Indeed. And, um, and Helena Bonner Carter yeah. as well. I, I'll, I'll have to go and check it again then, because I must admit, I did see it at the cinema, and um, I've mm-hmm. only seen it the once, and I'll be honest, um, I wasn't a fan at all, okay? I mean, I, I'm, oh, not, okay. I'm not a big fan of musicals anyway, uh, in general. I, I always think, you know, I mean, this isn't completely true for everything. Like, for example, I love Moulin Rouge. Uh, I thought it was a great film, um, but... Yeah, but, I love but, Moulin um, Rouge as well. Uh, you, I think it was, you know, all, all of that sort of pop culture songs that I'd grown up with being put into it was 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 a big draw. But um, um, but 
the thing is, generally, and this is a bit of a sort of sweeping generalization I'm making now, which I'll probably caveat the hell out of. But um, generally, I always sort of feel that um, musicals for me seem to work better on stage. And I think it's got something to do with that suspending your disbelief more at the theatre than, than on film. Um, and I don't know, you know, films, I know, I know they don't have to be realistic, of, co- of course not. But um, but at the same <laughs> time, I, I don't know, I always sort of have a problem with people sort of bursting into song and, and music appearing and all this. So it's not one of my favourite, um, it's not one of my favourite genres, but uh, I do okay. I do definitely remember the um, remember it being very graphic and like you said about the 18 certificate um definitely worthy of the 18 certificate it was quite nasty but then of course Sweeney Todd is is quite a nasty story anyway isn't it a nasty fable anyway so um uh but interesting now you you you've you've actually made me kind of want to see it again now to see if there's something that maybe I missed which quite you know often often sometimes you know, really good films. I don't think it matters what mood you're in, but there are films sometimes that if you go into the cinema and you're just not in the right headspace, you know, something's going on in your life that's that's bothering you. As much as it can be an escapism, sometimes it can be a distraction as well. And uh, maybe I just, when I saw it, just wasn't really in the right frame of mind or whatever. Because I remember not being overly impressed at the time. But um, you know, right? I I I, I tell you what, the best thing you should do. Don't watch the film. Listen to the soundtrack. Listen to the soundtrack. It's, uh, musical is like listening to an album. It's the songs. So if you don't really know the songs, you're not going to get into it. Now, after I watched it at Stephen's place, I got the soundtrack. Right. And I listened, I listened to it a lot. I used to listen on the bus. all that kind. Of... So I got to know the music really well. So when you watch it, you know the songs, you know, and that's where the enjoy- enjoyment comes out of it. I mean, the other thing about Sweeney Todd is um, it's based on a, a 70s version of the story because Sweeney Todd is not a real character. He's fictitious. It's been made up, but it's a, sto- it's, it, but it's a character that's been used a lot. And there was one version of it in the 70s uh, where it used uh the Ma- the Count of Monte Cristo and the Re- the Revengers tale as part of the story hence why he's got a tragic backstory and why it's very tragic i mean it just really shows you that revenge is a a path that leads to misery okay it very much so because the the story of of this Sweeney Todd is about the creation of a monster yeah no, I, well, I, I remember it being horrific, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the character of Sweeney Todd is he is a monster of his own creation and the creation of others, the judge and um, Helena Bonacarte's character. And at the end, he is he's so disconnected from reality that he kills his own wife. He doesn't realize it's his own wife. You know, he he does it because revenge is is what's on his mind. He does it because the judge is going to going to turn up, and the only thing he can do because he, all humanity's left him. Instead of like, go on, get out, he slits her throat and drops her down into the uh, into the basement. Wow. Okay. You know, it's just a, a horrifying moment. I mean, it's 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 more horrifying when you realise who that character is. Because the first time you watched it, you just, I think there's a bit of a disconnect because it's another, because you've seen so many people get their throats get <laughs> slit by this point. By this you know? mad barber, yeah. <laughs> but it's only because he, he, he is just solely minded on killing this judge, getting his revenge, that he doesn't see what else is going around him. And it is, it's very tragic. Um, Fair enough. I, and I remember, obviously, it's got a lot of, um, a lot of Tim Burton's, you know, visual stamps over it as well, hasn't it? It's it's a very oh, visual yeah. um, film as much as it's, well, obviously it is the perfect, you know, combination of audio and visual because obviously I, I take your point, what you're saying about the the, the, the musical and the lyrics and, and, and things of that nature, but also, um, you know, it, it, it is quite graphic as well, isn't it? And disturbingly yes. so. It's very graphic, yeah. Okay, well, I might that might be one to stick down on the 
give it another go pile. And, and trust me, I've had that over the years. I've had films that on first watch I really haven't enjoyed and I've watched them again and, you, you know, they, they, they turn into one of my favourites or something. So this this could well be the case, you know. <laughs> Tell me about it. I, the first time I watched Pulp Fiction, I didn't get it. I, I, it took me several several goes to finally get it. Right, okay, fair enough. But I, I, it didn't help that I, I saw it in parts and usually around at people's houses when parties are going on it's not a very good environment to get into yeah not really the right way to watch pulp fiction no definitely <laughs> no but it, it, it took me a couple of goes to get into it and sometimes that's the case with films that the first time you watch it it's just a case of watching it and then when you go back and revisit it that's where the enjoyment comes out of it because you know what's going to happen it's, you know you enjoy the characters more instead of just waiting for that thing to happen at the end mm-hmm. Which you know sometimes you you have going f- when you watch a film the first time you just you sort of you know you're just aware of when's the ending when's the ending must be near the ending now must be getting to the end I'm not talking about boring films I'm thinking about films in general where you you're sitting there and you're watching there and you think oh wow I'm, I'm enjoying this but it must be near the end now <laughs> you know you're still sort of weaving your way through that maze for the first time and you wonder when am I going to get out yeah no absolutely I mean it yeah. can be a good thing or a bad, bad thing, thing. Yeah, yeah so yeah. um I, I think when I was young or much younger and I you know until I sort of got it I was probably the same way with with something like dare I say it you know people would be hissing uh listening to this but you know when I first watched um uh The Shining I don't think I really got it but then, you know, uh, now I regard it as an absolute masterpiece in, in, in filmmaking. But it's, yeah, it's funny, you know, it, it, it's, I was probably a bit too young when I first watched it to really sort of get what it was about. <laughs> the thing about The Shining as well is it's all about environment where you watch it. I've watched, I've seen The Shining a lot and I, you know, I'd seen it on TV, seen it on Channel 4 a lot. And I got the DVD box set, the Stanley Kubrick collection. And I, I yes, I have that. It's very good, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I sat down and I watched it uh, in the house by myself, all the lights off. Scared the shit out of me. I was absolutely, uh, at the end of that film, I was kind of going up the stairs, going into the, you know, every creak, every noise. It really mm. freaked me out. And I couldn't, but the thing was, I was scratching my head because I'm going, I've seen this already. I've seen this several times and sometimes the film, it takes a few goes to actually get it to under your skin, especially uh, Kubrick. Mm, no, definitely. Definitely. I agree. I mean, uh, I think he's a director that I've come to, um, you know, appreciate, you, you know, more in my adulthood or, or, or you know, as, as I've become older, if you like. Oh, indeed. So, um, Indeed, but uh, but I I know that that wrong podcast, right? Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we, back, back to Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd, sorry. yes, we, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I'm. We'll definitely be talking about Kubrick in a, a future podcast because I'm I'm a massive fan. But uh, yes, yeah, Sweeney Todd, and um, it's one of the films I actually like Sasha Baron Cohen in. <laughs> yes, I am not a fan. Absolutely not a fan. I I hate the Ali G, Borat, all that stuff. <laughs> I hate it. Uh, I, I, this is very different. It is from that. very it's diff- fair to say. He's yeah, very yeah. good in this as Pirelli. Pirelli. And um, the only other film I like him in is, is Hugo. Right. I thought he was very good as the, um, the guard at the, um, the train station. Okay. I thought he was very good in that. But uh, everything else, no. You know, if he's if he's in it, I sort of go the other way. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I mean, he was working with Scorsese for that one, so you know, come on. <laughs> I think it's the role. I think it's the role. Um, I think uh, he. I saw the making of of Sweeney Todd, and they were saying that he or he or he actually chased chased them for the role, and he was doing uh, "If I Was a Rich Man" from Fiddle on the Roof. Right. And that's what got him the job because they didn't realize he was such a good singer. And, you know, I mean, every, everybody sort of steps up to the plate on the scene. It's all their own voices. It's they're not miming. It's not a dub. 
I mean, not singing on set. I mean, it's all pre-recorded. Yeah, it's, it's not Les Mis. <laughs> <It's> not... <laughs> but, but I, what, but what I mean is that it's, that it's their own singing voices. Yeah, no, I understand what you mean. And you know, it's the only film you ever hear Alan Rickman singing. Wow. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I, seriously, you've 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 kind of um, inspired me to add it to my uh, long list of films that I need to revisit at some point, as well as all the new ones I need to see. So yeah. Um, Thanks for that. <laughs> get, I, I think, get the soundtrack. I'll give you a copy if you want, ah. oh, and listen to it. And if 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 you really enjoy the soundtrack, go back and watch the film. Yeah. Okay. And if you don't like the soundtrack, you're not gonna like the film. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as I said, it's it's because it's eighty percent singing. Of course. Yeah. Eighty percent, twenty percent dialogue, eighty percent singing. What do you think made? Um, I mean, again, I don't know because I didn't particularly enjoy the film much i i've not like looked into sort of any of the production history or special features or anything but what what was it that inspired um tim burton to do that do you know anything about what why he chose to tell that particular story well um on the documentary um stephen Sonheim, the composer you know who's um famous for doing west side story mm-hmm. he said that tim burton approached them 20 years ago Wow, twenty years from before they made the film, wanting to do it because he had seen the original play with uh, Angela Lansbury. I said that right. Didn't I? Angela Lansbury, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah, murder. She wrote, uh, Miss. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, she played uh, Mrs. Lovett, which is the role that Helena Bonham Carter plays. Okay, right. And he he wanted to do it, and you know it, it does. It fits. I think it fits him like a glove. And it was great that he was able to do it his own way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, take I mean, that it's... classic and and reimagine yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Exactly, because the score is very um, Herman esque, Bernard Herman. Right. And oh, I yeah. should love it then. <laughs> yeah. I, I you might have been just in the wrong. Mood I, I might well have been, to be honest. Um, yes, quite possibly. Uh, but uh, okay, well, I, I may well go and. Uh, and revisit that at a, at a later stage certainly okay cool right so we've been to movie heaven let's go to movie hell so keith what is your choice for movie hell right well again um you, you know <laughs> I, uh, I i i sort of thought long and hard about this because like i said um you, you know tim burton there are a lot of films of his that I that I really love, and then there are some that I'm not so keen on, you know, in his in his body of work. And um, uh, you, you know, it was quite easy to find the ones that that I really like, you know, like Big Fish, Edward Scissorhands, Sleepy Hollow. I love all those films, but I, you know, even though I say that there's some that I don't like so much, it was kind of hard to pick one. So um, what I chose, I guess it's a bit loaded. I chose it because because of the actual franchise but it's it's another film that he that he that he um did an, an interpretation of and um uh, it, i actually chose planet of the apes which he did in 2001 okay and um you, you know i i say this it, it's not all bad there, there's some really good things about it which which i'll cover but also ultimately a bit like i said last week when i was talking you, you know i don't think it works and i've got my sort of reasons for that um but what, what i think was interesting is i seem to remember of planet of the apes this was the first even though you know one could argue that batman was exactly the same thing but uh it was when this term reimagined first started getting batting batted around before that everything was a remake yeah um and and you know people use the term remake but um i remember this being the first film and then a couple of years later they they used it in television with the battlestar galactica mini series where they, where they use this term reimagined which you, you know well yeah but the battlestar galactica series was a reimagining completely yeah. no I totally mean, I'm, I'm not saying yeah. i disagree with the uh, terminology I, I, you but know, I see for it. the planet of the apes remake it was a remake well, yes and no. I mean, it, it took. Um, it took... Well, I mean, it was. The, I'll, I'll give you my reasons for saying. Okay. That. Because with Battlestar Galactica, the Cylons became human. Oh yeah, no, it's completely different interpretation. 
And both are equally valid, in my opinion. I love that. I mean, again, a whole other podcast, but I love Galactica, both versions. So, yeah. But the Planet of the Apes remake, they just updated the costumes. Well, I mean, some they of the did. Story, they, 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 I mean, well, the, the story, the is... story is slightly different, but it is still about an astronaut who crashes onto the planet. This time it's Marky Mark. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, you know, and he it, it, it's like a truncated version of that story. So he he gets captured the same way. When they're they're herding when they're, ca- you know, when the, the apes are out um, herding the humans so they can be captured. Exactly the same. I mean, he used some different ideas in this one. Uh, I mean, you know, there are things that are good about it. Um, definitely. Um, but the thing is, the thing with me is, is I was a I was a a fan of the the original series of five movies that, that I you know obviously remember from my childhood and and continued to watch sort of as an adult um very much like those I uh, had some memory of the short lived tv series and the animated series um never actually read the original french uh, novel that it's based on um, oh I, I i i haven't read it but i know the ending yeah is. well the ending they... kind of i mean i think Burton was somewhat inspired by that, inspired with by his, that ending, yeah, with his version. But that's but, all right. We can talk. We can talk about this because at the end of the day, this is a about this is a podcast where we're going to talk about films, and I'm afraid you can't really talk about film in depth without spoiling it. No, no. Well, the end. The ending. I got loads of loads of comments on that. But I mean, essentially, you know, I love I love the franchise. I also, you know, I am a big big fan of the. Um, the, the, the prequel reboots that, that that they made the two films that they made which i which i call i don't think this is a correct vernacular or a correct term but i call them kind of pre-boots because because they're, <laughs> they're sort of prequel reboots and but, Oops, you yes. know reboots yeah. came a few years later with with batman begins in fact where they started sort of touting that which they'd been obviously using in comic book um literature for years but uh but um yeah i mean you, you know planet of the apes um uh it, it is a sort of retelling of of the first film to to a certain extent with, with differences and you, you you know i think i'll sum up what what i think was good about it first before i sort of go into the reasons i didn't think it worked i mean um it does have some some good actors and good performances in it it's obviously got helena barnum carter is one of his usuals but the standouts for me were the likes of Tim Roth and who plays the sort of evil chimpanzee character in this one and um, uh, Paul Giamatti who's very much the comic relief as it was one of the orangutans but uh, very amusing Um, and you know you've got David Warner you've got you you know that there are a lot of Chris Christopherson there's there's a lot of good actors in this film there is I mean Uh, Charlton Heston well has a has a cameo yeah I'll, as a ch- as as an eight, he does. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll get to that bit, but uh, <laughs> you, you know, and you've got obviously Stella Warren, who's just lovely, uh, and you've got you know all this stuff. But the, the, right. the thing is, can I just can I just want to say, I mean, I I, I went back and I, I watched our picks just to go back, and I cannot understand why Stella Warren was picked, apart from the fact that she was probably the it go at the time. Oh, definitely, because yeah. she is. Fucking awful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, definitely. I'm not saying what I'm saying. It's got a good cast. Uh, I wasn't meaning her as one of them in terms. Of, <laughs> I was only meaning from a from an aesthetic point of view. But yes. I've, oh, okay. Uh, but 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 no. I mean, I mean, you know, there's some good points. The the Rick Baker did the makeup for it and did a very good job of sort of, um, you know, in uh, obviously now I know it's all done with with CGI and motion capture. But but this film we were still a little early for that. Um, so it had evolved from what they'd done in the 60s and 70s, but, um, you, you know, worked very well. And one of the ideas I did like about the film that, that Tim Burton um, decided to do was um, the whole apes movement. Uh, he, he figured in this one, they'd be less evolved than how they appeared in the in the in the original movie back in 68 or whatever. Um, and they, they would move and, and, and have some behavior a bit more like apes, even though they had this, you know, society and they could speak and they, you know, evolved intelligence and all of that sort of thing. And uh, I know that they sort of had an ape school, if you like, and got the actors to very much sort of 
adopt those roles. And I thought that was one of the ideas uh, or one of the uh, reimaginings that, that actually worked quite nicely. It worked for the most part, but I will say there were some times where it just went really over the top. I mean, the fact with um, General Fame, the character played by Tim Roth, he's jumping around. I mean, not jumping like a like a chimpanzee. I mean, he's jumping great heights. Like a super cute, like Superman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah I was just, oh, I mean, you know, he does this attack where, all right, I mean, I'm going to just say there's one bit I had a problem with was that these two apes d discover where the ship has crashed. So you see where it's come through the tree line and it's, you know, but you don't actually see the ship. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, he has no idea what his father's going to tell him, the big revelation. But yet he still feels the need to cover it up. It just if it, it felt like it was a scene that should have happened later on and it they moved it forward or, or whatever because he kills them. And then, oh, no, I'm, sorry, I'm saying he kills them, throws them into the water. And then you, of course, when Marky Mark dives in to, to get his gun that lasts five seconds and his tracker, I mean, you see the dead chimpanzees there, but it just felt like a scene that should have been happening later after the fact he, he knew what the, you know, the secret his father was keeping. It just didn't make any any sense no no absolutely i mean th well this is the thing this is this is where i can sort of start maybe going into you, you know there are there are a few there are some of the acting or actors and their performances that i liked uh i like some of the design elements of it uh, i like some of the new ideas he tried however um overall i didn't think it worked and that was for a lot of reasons i mean you, you mentioned about you know batman being a bit of a mess well i i think this is a film that's a bit of a mess um in so much as uh, obviously because it's a reimagining, re not a remake, um, Mr. Marky Mark Warburg, um, he's playing Captain Leo Davison. He's not Taylor. He's not Charlton Heston from the from the first film. And interestingly enough, apparently he 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 refused to appear in a loincloth because of his Calvin Klein modeling days or whatever. So he didn't want to. He didn't want to, um, dare I say it, ape, ape um, Charlton Heston <laughs> uh, performance in that. But, um, I have no problems with that. I don't want to see Mark no, and Mark no, in a loincloth either. Not do I particularly. But, um, but the, thing, the thing I didn't like with it is, first of all, a, a bit like my one of my issues with um, uh, Batman Returns that I was mentioning earlier, is instead of going like the, the, the 1968 film, they went out on location yeah, and yes. filmed this. Whereas... This was, I, I don't know whether it was done for budgetary reasons or what, what, but it was a very much a studio-based film and felt like it. I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the, the sets were very well made and, and things of that the nature. I but... think the, the first half where um, the crash landing is and the Ape City, yeah. yes. When, when they get to the crashed spaceship, that's very much outside. Yeah. Over that, it was a very big studio. Oh well, no, that, that that bit towards the end of the film, absolutely. But the, the the you know when when he crashes, when you first see you know the reveal, if you like, with the apes and whatever. Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't particularly invested in that. I thought they they did it much better. You know, thirty some years earlier in the in the original. The the original is far superior. Yeah, far superior. And and the thing that annoyed me about the remake was that there's no point to it. The the original, yeah, the original had a point. It was talking about its time, the whole idea of what makes a man, and the, you know, for a good chunk of that story, the film, um, Charlton Heston can't talk. Yeah, you know, and he he can't, you know, he can't differentiate. They can't differentiate him from other people, from the other humans. So when he does talk, it's this big thing, and of course they 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 pick the lines all the famous lines out of planet of the apes and they they use them and it's that whole thing about remakes where they 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 take a line everybody knows and they use it but they try to be clever yeah the, 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 they, they, they try weren't be clever and it doesn't i mean work. this is one of the things yeah. i hated about it i mean whereas whereas in the in the um pre-boot series that's just sort of started uh there's lots of references and homages in that but i think they've done them 
quite subtle and quite well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, this the one the the the, the lines in this um, were were absolutely winking at the camera beyond belief oh. and just did not work at all. And I thought, no. particularly Heston's cameo. Um, you know, with the whole damn them, damn them all to hell sort of thing. I just oh, thought yeah. that was appalling. I groaned. I was just like, oh, this is horrible. Um, you, you, you know, so uh, I, I didn't like I didn't like the references that they made like that. I thought um, I, I didn't think those worked. They were just shoehorned in. Absolutely. Shoehorned in. Absolutely. They didn't, and one of the things. Nothing that, to do with the story no. at all. And, and one of the things that they reimagined as you absolutely pointed out which again didn't work is in the original yet having the humans not being able to speak and the apes being the ones to speak was brilliant yeah that was the but in this one choosing to you know have the humans able to talk kind of took away from it a little bit i think in terms of the thematics of it um i i can't remember but i think wasn't they the like the descendants of another um crashed um spaceship or something i they think had, so they, they hadn't they hadn't they weren't part of that planet they had come there but i, I was when i watched it again I, I i remember remember that bit watching it ages ago but this time this time it wasn't there yeah um yeah i mean it, it they, they could have been descendants of the original crew that crash land there with the monkeys yeah but uh, it's, I mean, um, it it, it's, it it doesn't. It, if you try and no. wrap your head around the logic no, of it the doesn't. film, it doesn't work at all. I mean, the the bit at the end where you have the big showdown, yeah. and they get to the ship, and then all the all the other humans turn up, all these tribes, and they go, and Marky Marks go, where did all these people come from? And the the guy who's like he's the groomed human. He's like he's been a, he's been like in the city for a long time goes word has spread around the tribes about the human who defies the humans uh sorry defies the apes and you're like wait a minute it's only been a day yeah. how the fuck did that that's some great, yeah, no, it's great <laughs> message going... service they got yeah no exactly they've they, oh, they, 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 they got more just... technology than they let on haven't they but uh oh, no i mean i mean it, so... it, it doesn't it doesn't work it really doesn't work the the other thing is and again i know um, Tim Burton tried to sort of borrow borrow a little bit here from from the the source material in terms of the actual novel a little bit, but the the end the ending trying to be sort of clever was just really totally confusing because it didn't actually make any sense whatsoever. I mean, the the only thing that could have that that, that could make it make any sense is to say that the the chimp you know, return to Earth sometime in the 20th century and 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 change things because, you, you know, the references of the Lincoln Memorial. Right. And, OK, and this this is where it, this is where it gets really stupid. stupid. Yeah, no, absolutely. What it says on the Lincoln Memorial is General Fane, the character that Tim Roth plays yeah. and his battle against the humans, he's been raised up. So what they're trying to say is that the planet he was on was Earth in the past and now he's gone and it's the future, but it's our present time and it makes no fucking sense. Oh, absolutely. But that doesn't make any sense because because they've got they've got police cars with to serve and protect and, and you're like every everything's just too much you know as it as it is and i i i guess you really you know it's a movie and you're not necessarily supposed to try and in intellectualize it or make sense of it i know but, but it's got to make some sense of, yeah it, it it's got to make some really sense i mean the, the the ending of the original one was amazing and gut-wrenching well brilliant with the the reveal of the statue of liberty and it was like amazing yeah but this 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 wasn't clever at all this was just show off and it wasn't it was just the sake of having a, a twist in there and as i say the lincoln memorial because general fane at the end you know he's locked away you know there's peace amongst the humans and the apes yeah you know why would they make a memorial to that to him exactly of exactly all yeah. and, and unless they were going to unless it was going to be like a sequel that never got made yeah and why would it be in the exact same place as 
as the Abraham Lincoln Memorial in Washington. And, you know, that they, they had all the other landmarks there. And it was just, you, you know, I, I was trying because unfortunately, this is how sad I am is, you know, when I watch films, I, I watch them, you know, obviously from the very much from a filmmaking point of view, but also from a wanting it to be believable and real point of view. And of course, I was trying to find almost like the fans answer to make this make sense. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and it was just like, well, he must have come back at some point in the 20th century and, you know, and all this sort of thing. But it just didn't make sense. In it. And I don't know. I don't know whether it was trying to set up for a, for a sequel. God knows Probably how they would have explained that if, if they had. But it was just this is this is the reason that I've chosen it as the if you like the movie hell as to where whereas there are bits that there are elements of it that I think are good and that I liked um y y you know overall I I don't think the film um works at all and it's disappointing and also it's probably the one that's got the least of a Tim Burton stamp to it in many respects I know you you love the animal movement the ape movement in it, but it, it did to me feel like that they were concentrating on that so much and not concentrating on anything else you know it's like the story poof. yeah I know I just I just like the idea behind it I thought it was I, I you know in terms of this reimagining and in inverted commas I, I I thought that um you, you know the the having um you know the trying out some different things was 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 not a bad idea to do but as I said overall ultimately particularly compared to you know the first the original 1968 movie is amazing. Uh, you know, it's still a classic. It's still still great. And as I said, I like what they've done with it since as well, where they've tried to do something else and go more into backstory and whatever. But this was kind of, it didn't really know what it was. And, um, you, you, you know, I, I feel that it was, well, I mean, it was, a, my understanding was it was a bit of a flop anyway, hence why um, they decided 10 years later to sort of reboot it again, because, uh, you, you couldn't really go anywhere with this, <laughs> you know. No, not so. And 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 it and it was also in that sort of era where you know Mark Wahlberg was getting sort of tired of being the sort of bad remake guy. <laughs> 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 so um, you, you, yeah. you know, um, but although you know, again, a whole other podcast. I, I quite liked your idea about you know our remakes in general you know are the originals always better and you know i've been thinking about lots of films that have been remade where i actually think the remake is better than the original but i said i won't go there now because we'll be talking about that for an hour <laughs> i know <laughs> but, but uh, i think we can get into it much more with our next director oh really just a hint okay just a hint yes okay um yes our, our director for c Okay, because I was wondering. Obviously, with C, there's quite a few we could we could pick there. So I didn't know what you had in mind. So, um, uh, but I'll, well, I'll, I'll I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you off. I'll, I'll, I'll go with whatever you know me. So anyway, but um, yeah. So um, you, you know, past, present, or or current, whatever. I'm I'm happy to talk about directors and films, as you well know. So, um, but yeah. So so that's so, sorry to sort of labour it, but that that's why much as I'm a big fan of the whole Planet of the Apes uh, mythology and, and, and series of movies, etc., cetera, um, this film was, was a Tim Burton dud for me. I know. And, and why do they always keep bundling it with the box sets? You know, get the Planet of the Apes box set, all eight films, and you go, can I not have the Tim uh, Burton one? Well, please, unfortunately, I'm please, a completist, not that one. so I've got it anyway. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> And I've watched all the extras. I mean, I've I've done it. You know, I've been through, I've been through to try and have my mind changed on it. But no, basically, it is my first reaction when I saw it, which was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> so your movie hell is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right? Which I have to confess, I haven't seen. Right? Have you seen? the uh Jim Wilder version Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Fan yeah I mean I, it's one of those films again I, I was never a massive fan um it was one of those films I saw as a kid growing up on on television and whatever and I've seen it a few times and I've always thought it was okay um but was never really you know it's not one of my I don't have it on DVD for example or anything like that so um I've not seen it in some time but I don't know there was just something that 
much as I like Johnny Depp, much as I like Tim Burton and whatever, there was nothing that really sort of drew me to go and see Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And it, it's a it's a massive misstep, really. Um, okay, so Charlie and the Chocolate Factory came out summer two thousand five. Now the summer two thousand five was one of those rare events where you had films by Ridley Scott, which was Kingdom of Heaven, George Lucas, which was Episode Three, Revenge of the Sith. You had Steven Spielberg with uh, War of the Worlds, and you had Tim Burton. Usually you might get one or two of those guys in a, a summer season. We got all four. And not their best work, to be fair. <laughs> Apart from Kingdom of Heaven. Right, okay. I, I, I absolutely love Kingdom of Heaven. I think it's a great film. I don't care what people say about... Um, Orlando Bloom in it. Or Blando Bland, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the director's cut is even better. Right, oh, I haven't I, seen that. I, so. I, I saw it at the cinema, loved that film. Okay. But I'm not talking about uh, Kingdom of Heaven. We're talking about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Okay. Now, um, Tim Burton is very good at world building. And the first 20 minutes of this film is great. I think in some ways is better than Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory building it up. He creates this whole world where they're going mad for Wonka goods, for the Wonka bars. Really well done. Really well done. Getting all those characters together. I did miss the bit where he fight when Charlie finds the golden ticket and he's not singing, I found a golden ticket. I found a <laughs> missed that completely. And this is the thing. I kept when I watch this film, I compare it to the, the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory version. And it's that version is so much better. It's when we get to the appearance of Willy Wonka, um, Johnny Depp playing a mixture of, uh, I don't know, uh, autistic <laughs> and Michael Jackson. Uh, it's creepy as hell. Absolutely <laughs> creepy as hell. But it also is, it's, it's, that's where the film just goes. And I think the load of choices in it are awful. Uh, a lot of use in CGI, which doesn't work very well in some places. You can really tell it's CGI. Uh, I mean, I like the idea that he used Deep Roy to play all the Oompa Loompas. Right. And the bit when he's t telling them about how he met them, I thought that bit was great. Because that's straight out of um, Charlie and the Glass Elevator. Right. Deep Roy does all right, doesn't he, career-wise? Yeah. He does, he's yeah, got yeah. That, that pretty much down, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he's worked in so many films. Absolutely. It's unbelievable. But the thing is, it's just none of it's memorable. Right. Right. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Can you remember the Oompa Loompa songs? Of course, yes. <laughs> much to my annoyance at times, but yes, yeah. <laughs> I cannot remember one of the songs that Deep Roy does. The Oompa Loompa songs, each one is done in a different musical style. I'm sure Danny Elfman had a blast doing all this, but for the life of me, I cannot remember a single one of them. But yeah, I can remember Oompa Loompa Diddy Dum Do. I've got another riddle for you. I mean, I can remember that. Yeah, I haven't watched that film in ages. Yeah. I can remember that bloody song. I cannot, I mean, I saw Charlie in the Chocolate Factory last weekend. Can still not remember any bloody songs from it. Right, interesting. So it, it really didn't didn't have a, a a stamp that that was memorable. It, it does, and I know it's more faithful to the book than uh, Willy Wonka. But the problem is, Gene Wilder's version of Willy Wonka is far superior. He is more of a madman genius than. Johnny Depp is. Johnny Depp is playing him as a, as a child. And do you think, I'm, I'm quite interested in this, as we know, um, you know, Johnny Depp is obviously a, a frequent collaborator with, um, with Tim Burton. Um, do you think that maybe some of the problem was that Johnny Depp was possibly given too much free reign to go off and sort of play against his type and, and, and go off and do his own sort of thing like he likes to do? Um, I don't know. I'm just asking that question. As I said, I've not seen it, so I can't really uh, comment. But... I, I don't think he's, it's not like he's been let off the leash and he's gone off and done his career. Because it, in the world that Tim Burton set up, it, 
kind of works. Right. But it doesn't work, if you know what I mean. It just, it, it, because I'm just always comparing it to the original film and the original film just works so much better. I mean, the, the, a lot of the choices in it seem to be right, but it just doesn't come together. Right. It just does not work as well as that original film from the 60s. Mm. It's kind of interesting, actually. I'm thinking about this. I mean, completely unintentionally, but, you know, you said early in the podcast about, you know, a lot of his films are, are remakes or reimaginings or interpretations, whatever. When you think about it, the, the four that we've picked kind of are, aren't they? They're not like original pieces of his work necessarily. No, no, they're not. Um, no. Which is quite we, interesting. We, <laughs> but that's that's our picks. Yeah, that we picked it as I mean, the I'm, good and the bad. <laughs> so. I mean, I I could have quite easily picked Beetlejuice. Yeah. Or Ed Wood or Mars Attacks or Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. I could have picked Big Fish. I really like that film. Yeah. So yeah. But the thing is, I don't own any of those films. Right. But I own Sweeney Todd. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, so um, I, I take it by what I have on my shelf a lot of the time. Yeah, no, so I make sense. If I don't have it on my shelf, there's a reason why I haven't got it. Yeah, I usually go with a bit of a gut instinct. And, you know, obviously when you mention Tim Burton, just because of who I am and what I'm into, of course, uh, Batman and Planet of the Apes spring to mind straight away. So uh, for, for different well, reasons. That's it. My, so, yeah. my, I always go with my initial reaction as well. Yeah. But um, in this case, I I went with what was on my shelf as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, I mean, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is yeah. I, I'm, the other problem as well is that they've shoehorned um, the story about how Ch uh, Willy Wonka had a falling out with his father, played by um, Christopher Lee, who's a dentist. <laughs> oh right, okay. Where the film should end, where Charlie's won the prize. It keeps going because Willy Wonka wants him to leave his family and he doesn't want to do that. Right. And he can't understand that because he left his father or his father left him. It's this weird thing where uh, it's, it is a bit of a fantasy where uh, Willy Wonka leaves home as a kid because he's discovered the joy of chocolate. Because his father, who's a dentist, doesn't allow him to eat chocolate because, you know, dentures and all this kind of stuff. Right. And he threatens to leave home. And he's, and Christopher Lee says, if you leave home, I will not be here when you come back. And they, this is, this, I mean, there's some great filmmaking. There's this lovely bit where you see him walking along and all these flags are flying in the background. You think, oh, he's visiting all these countries. And then you realize he's in a, in a museum with these flags. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, you know, he gets, you know, it's closing time. He has to get thrown out. So he goes back home and where the house was, it's gone. Just just the empty space in between the other houses where the house used to be. So there's still there's still clever bits in it then. There's still good bits in it. It's not all bad. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's not all bad. I mean, it's just as I, I grew up on Ronald Dow, you know, I, I I know Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the Glass Elevator. Read it a lot at school. Read it at home. Loved that stuff. I loved the. Uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It's got some great songs in it. That still gets you know surface from time to time. Uh, but uh, you know, it's just it's just it's a sh well okay. It's I guess it's a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory for a new generation. Right. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. kids who have grown up on it love it. And if they were to see the the Willy Wonka one, it's like, what's with all the orange people with green hair? That's weird. You know, I think that might be what it is. OK, it, it's interesting. It's interesting that um, obviously, you know, when you pick, you know, um, Sweeney Todd was a musical and it, and it worked really well. Yet in this case, the, the music in, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory really doesn't work and isn't memorable um that's kind of interesting it's like you know i think the the thing as well is that with charlie and the chocolate factory it plays like a film so you don't get the songs until they're in the factory right. until you see the dumpa lumpers and and then we go into these musical bits i think that kind of what is a bit grating because at least with william Wonka and the chocolate factory it is a musical the whole thing is a musical and you get those songs before we even get into the factory 
I mean, the opening song is The Candyman. Which I have to say, watching that recently is kind of creepy. Yeah, I mean, it is quite a creepy idea, isn't it? <laughs> that that opening scene with the, uh, the 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 sweet shop owner singing to all the kids is a bit creepy. <laughs> yeah, it, you couldn't make that today. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah, mm. very creepy. But um, the rest of it is is wonderful. Great songs in it. Uh, Gene Wilder is really Wonka. He really is. You don't get any of that threat you get with um, with Johnny Depp's interpretation of it. Because the thing is, because in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, you, you, you see there's a mind working there. So when these things happen to the, to the bad kids, you can see that it was kind of done in a, in a designed way. Right. But yet with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, not so much. And yet they, they're, they're still inferring that he's kind of like a genius and it's all been set up to, ca- you know, to, 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 you know, to catch these kids out. Mm-hmm. And you just, you don't, you just look at him, you go, I, I don't think he can even tie his own shoes, let alone, you know, plan this kind of stuff. Fair enough. I mean, I, I must admit, like I said, shameful in some respects, but I haven't seen it. But I remember the, the reason was, is I wasn't particularly inspired by the, um, you know, by the trailer or whatever when I saw it. And also, you you know, you already mentioned that was quite a big year for summer blockbuster films and whatever. And, uh, you know, I I was probably busy watching those. (laughs) um, (laughs) Being disappointed by that. It was low on the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah, It wasn't wasn't the the best of years, was it, that that one? But uh, um, so interesting. Yeah. Okay. So that was our picks for Tim Burton for uh, Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. And uh, so, Keith, how can we find you? Oh, right. OK. Um, basically, uh, there is some of my work and certainly contact details on uh, the website Snake Gully Productions, which is www.snakegully, all is one word, productions.com. Um, yes, there's there's contact details and some work there although as i said earlier i must get around to doing a proper youtube channel like you have (laughs) (laughs) uh yes you can find my youtube channel uh at uh if you put in the search uh independent runnings that'll be me and you can check out my website at independentrunnings.com and that's independent runnings all one word so uh thank you for listening Please listen to our podcast extra where we get to talk about ourselves and not of uh, other filmmakers. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode of Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. See you then.